if you're doing something that you really want to do, you're going to feel anxious. It's going to be tough. You're going to be butting up against barriers and overcoming them and moving forward. And all of that tension means we have to accept it and realize that anxiety is a part of it and then moving over it or what I call transcending anxiety. When we f respond in a healthy way, we can actually turn anxiety into, I would even say, a blessing and an opportunity to thrive in our lives. And that's really the core of my, my approach. Hello, 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 and happy... Wednesday, welcome to the squeeze. That scared me. You have two Taylors and a Remy who is fast asleep on the chair next to us. Yeah. Lily is also in a bedroom by herself. <laughs> fast asleep. Fast asleep. It's oh just a, a quiet little Wednesday here. A quiet little Wednesday. Not in really. Home. But to our dogs it is. Yeah, to our dogs. Um, should we start with the citrus got real? Because Let's kick not? this off with a little citrus got real because... They are sitting right in front of me, and I really want to see what's inside of there. Let's do it. Okay. Whew, can I get a drum roll, please? What was the last TV show you binge-watched? Easy, peasy, lemon, squeezy. That would be Squid Game's The Challenge. Oh, I thought, and Bad Surgeon. Yes. Which one do we I guess technically... No, no. Well, technically, we watched the finale of Squid Games, the challenge, most recently. Technically, the last thing we watched was Paradise. That would be Bachelor in Paradise, for those of you wondering. Yes, we watch horrible television. Like hey, that, that, that AKA is... AKA great television. That what? is a great... Oh, we don't miss a season. Yeah. Um, Especially Paradise. Paradise is my... Yeah, that's definitely your favorite. It's my fave. But... Back to Squid Games, the challenge. If you haven't watched this show, oh my gosh, you need to get on it ASAP. Well, now I feel like we have to watch the actual show. I know we haven't. We didn't watch the the like real the scripted series. Yeah, we did um, it backwards. Technically, I did watch five episodes. This is this is what I say when people ask me. I've watched five episodes, but it was a man that was watching it on his laptop on a plane, like two rows in front of me, with subtitles. Mm, you're one of those. So I didn't hear it, but I watched it. But it was a little it was a little rough. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. So I like the I like this one instead. Anyways, go watch this show. It yeah. is so good. I watched eight episodes in one day, I think. Yeah, you really went for it. I was hooked. I think I joined in on like four or something. You did. You got in at like three or four. Yeah. It, it, oh. Yeah. I think what's like really cool, but I mean, the whole concept's insane and the set design and the production and everything is so good. But I think what's really cool about it is unlike other reality shows, the producers don't have much say into like who goes home because it's all like off of these like random chance challenges. Yeah. So it's really like they can't like, you know, there's no like producer like planting someone and keeping them until the end. It's really just like up in the air, which kind of makes it like more fun. Yeah. You just never know what's going to happen. Yeah. And if you don't know what it's about at all, the quick version is they take 456 people, strangers from all over the world, put them together in the Squid Games Challenge. They live together um, for like, I don't, I don't know how long they filmed it for, probably just like a week, week and a half. Um and the, the prize fund is $4.56 million. I, so whoever wins, yeah. only one person wins, walks away with $4.56 million. And they have different, you know, tests that are both, you know, both physical. Brain. Brain, not Honestly, there's not much physical. It's a very strategic game. Yeah. And it does not disappoint. Yeah. Anyways, that was a long answer to a citrus. Yeah, I'm going to put that one back in there because I like that question. That amount of money is crazy. So crazy. When you told me that, I was like, wait, what? Yeah. Where do they, how do you? I don't know. But we have an exciting episode today. As Remy changes her couches. She's just going to go back and forth the whole um, time. We do have a very exciting episode. And I feel like um, this episode is long overdue, but it also is perfect timing. Yes. Um, because holiday season 
is upon us. It is upon us. And for most, it can be um, a fun time, but also a stressful um, kind of anxiety driven time with family dynamics and boundaries and grief and just a lot of a lot of stuff. Yeah. Holidays are nice, but can also be um, tough, yeah. understandably. So, yeah, we have Dr. Ross Marin on today and he specializes in anxiety and stress, which we found out are two separate things, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, but he just kind of like talks about ways to overcome your anxiety, like tools to help thrive with it, because he does believe that, you know, obviously a lot of anxiety, no, but some anxiety and stress like can be a good thing. It can help, you know, Love drive that. us yeah. more. Um, which is such a fun fact, but we had fun. Like, I feel like we like sidebarred a lot with him just yeah. about us. Um, even, even when we hung up and got off the phone with him, we continued talking to him for like 20 more minutes cause he's so much fun. Yeah. After we wrapped the episode, we just stayed on. And we also talked about so much more that you will be seeing him again. Yeah. You will very much be seeing him again because we thought of a lot of, um, a lot of fun <laughs> episodes to do. Um, but we are just so excited to share the episode with you guys and hope you can take away something from it to make these next couple of weeks um, a little bit easier for you. Yeah. We'll see you on the other side. Dr. Ross Muren, thank you so much for being here with us today on The Squeeze. We are honored to have you. Thanks for having me. It's my honor to be here. Of course. We're, we're super excited to dive into all of this yes all we've i mean we talk about like anxiety and stress a lot on the show yeah. um but i feel like now it's such an important time because of holiday season and i feel like that is when a lot of stuff definitely gets a little heightened so we'll be sure to it's definitely the most common topic that when we have guests on you know talking about their life you yeah know, anxiety and stress and just like dealing with that on a daily basis i feel you like that's I'm not the, the most only one who has anxiety and <laughs> <laughs> exactly that's our whole point of this yeah. podcast is so right. everyone realizes that you are not alone yeah <laughs> i love that yeah um but i feel like a great place to start and something that um you kind of differentiate between which is Cool. We love breaking things down. I obviously love the science behind stuff because I'm a nurse and Taylor does not understand the science. Um, nor I, lo can he I really love comprehend. layman's terms. He loves layman's terms. So we're a good mix of them both. But I think a great place to start is just kind of like what the difference is between stress and anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about stress. Okay. So you, you have a background in nursing, so you know, stress better than I ever will. And that's when you have too many things to do and not enough time, not enough money, not enough resources. In other words, there's an imbalance between the demands on your life and the resources that you have. And certain fields, nursing definitely included, but other ones as well, um, you're perpetually in a state of having too much to do and just not enough capacity to be able to manage that. Um, mm -hmm. A little stress is fine, but when it's chronic, it can be a real problem and uh, needs to be adjusted. That's time to recalibrate and rebalance and to move things forward. That makes sense. Yeah. So in order to know anxiety, you now to know fear. So fear is a healthy response. It's a positive thing that keeps you safe if there's a threat. That's your fight or flight system. It's also known as the fight, flight, or freeze system. Mm -hmm. And if there's some sort of a threat, um, you know, an attacker or you're driving on the highway and somebody does something dangerous or, you know, these kinds of situations in a nanosecond, you get a shot of adrenaline into your bloodstream and your pupils open up more in order to increase your field of vis vision. Your heart starts to pump, your mm -hmm. breathing starts to increase, your muscles tense up all in order to help you to avoid the threat and, or in order to fight it or freeze. So that way it'll protect you. It's a very healthy, positive, neurologically strong sign, sign of strength when people are having fear. Anxiety is the exact same as fear, but there's one difference. Either of you know? Fear Let's, is like, I don't know. I was going to say an actual threat, but fear some anxiety yeah. maybe is like made up. That's it. Oh. That's exactly it. That's exactly Ooh. it. Ding, ding. Goes to Tay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll give the... Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> so... 
anxiety is when the threat is not real. So it's a okay. false alarm. It's a trigger of your adrenal glands when you didn't need to have them triggered. Nothing okay. more, nothing less. And it happens to everyone. We have false alarms all the time. It's just your neural system firing up in case you did need it one day. Um, now, granted, some people have too much anxiety, so to speak, and it's always going. Um, but it's really not a sign of anything catastrophically wrong. I've never had a, a single patient die from anxiety, and this is why. It's actually not an unhealthy process for people to go through. But, okay, here's my question with that then. Mm -hmm. if, if you can just say, you know, fear is real, anxiety is not, or not, I mean, like if you have social anxiety, does that not mean that it's like a real fear? Okay, great question. So firstly, we talk about dying from embarrassment, but I've never seen that actually happen. Right. And yes, it is a, there's a fear component to it, but the actual threat, I mean, listen, like I'm speaking to somebody who's been in movies. So for you, like public image, there might be some real consequences to, you know, certain social situations. And I get that. For most people, mm, probably not. Usually what people think about us, firstly, they think about us a lot less than we believe that they do right in general yeah. like they don't really yeah. care people are thinking about themselves firstly secondly yeah. even if they think something negative like okay what are the real consequences so usually that piece is in the realm of anxiety um but it does feel real and in certain fields there could be aspects of fear potentially mm -hmm. okay interesting yeah wow but it doesn't matter <laughs> i mean so let's say it's a false alarm Okay, so that's still a normal aspect. I mean, sometimes your fire alarm goes off in your house. Yeah. So what does that mean? We, you know, we often judge ourselves and say, like, if it's anxiety, it's bad. If it's fear, it's good. I don't, I don't believe, I don't buy that at all. I don't think mm -hmm. anxiety is a bad thing in any way. People have it. It's normal. Yeah. Yeah. So then, I mean, if, if you do deal with anxiety, which I think a lot of us can relate to, um, you talk about the, the approaches to dealing with anxiety and how there's usually two predominant approaches, which is either trying to cure it or just resigning to the idea that you're going to live with, you know, struggling with your anxiety and fear for the rest of your life. But you present a new third option. Can you let our listeners hear this, this new third um, option on how we can deal with this other than <laughs> trying to cure it every day or <laughs> just giving in and dealing with it for the rest of your life? Yeah, absolutely. I've been waiting for this moment. Um, kind of <laughs> like if you have, if you've got lemons, squeeze them and make some lemonade. <laughs> yeah. That. And it really is like that with anxiety. All of us have lemons. You're going to feel anxious. Your alarms are going to go off, especially in this current day. It's the way it is for a variety of reasons. Um, and I'm happy to get into why that is. But the question is when we feel anxious, and this gets into um, uh, the other take, guy, Tay, um, yeah. what you were saying before, how you respond when you feel anxious. That's really what counts. That's really yeah. what matters. When we f respond in a healthy way, we can actually turn anxiety into. I would even say a blessing and an opportunity to thrive in our lives. And that's really the core of my, my approach. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give an example of taking, you know, being, you know, feeling incredibly anxious about something, but how do you react the correct way to turn that into a blessing or into a positive thing? I can give you a hundred examples. You probably don't okay. need that many. I'll give you a couple. I'll give you a couple. You know, people who feel anxious, they often are much more in tune with the emotions of others. They're better able to empathize. They're better able to relate to people at a real emotional level, to actually understand what's going on for them, to go there, to risk talking about how they feel. I mean, look at this podcast. You have you know, tens of thousands of listeners, and where did it come from? It came from one or two people's experience of dealing with anxiety and then putting themselves out there it's a whole community and a whole network um, of empathy and of people connecting in ways that they didn't previously do. I mean, it's an amazing thing. And, and you're seeing this all over social media where people who speak about their, feel, their fears or their anxieties 
they yeah. it resonates it just hits a chord because we're so we're so lonely today and like this is really the the real conversations that people need to actually connect yeah that's a i mean that's a big thing for us is connecting with people and like one that's always been so important but I think we learned how truly important that is since COVID because a lot of us like lost that human to human connection. And that, that is something that we're really big on like bringing back um, and something that's important to us. And I think has definitely like helped a lot of people too, is just talking about it and making it normal and having that connection of, Oh, you know, like this person has this too. Like, Oh, that, that makes me feel a little bit better. This bustling holiday season, you might be looking for a nutritious, flavorful meal to fuel you on jam-packed days. Well, Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you eat well for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. With chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all of your holiday to-dos. You can choose from over 35 chef-crafted meals every week that support a healthy lifestyle and meet your meal preferences, whether it's calorie smart, vegan, veggie, protein plus, and many more wholesome options. You can head to factormeals.com slash thesqueeze50 and use code thesqueeze50 to get 50% off. That's code thesqueeze50 at factormeals.com slash thesqueeze50 to get 50% off we have more people dealing with anxiety on a daily basis than it feels like ever before. There are a ton of reasons. Firstly, we are having higher levels of anxiety and it's not just people reporting it. It's real. And the reason we know there are more people on disability today who cannot work because of their anxiety. Um, There are more people who are um, hurting themselves today, harming themselves. Mm -hmm. The suicide rate is through the roof. I mean, Mm -hmm. we're talking objective behavioral indicators that something is something is off yes to me the boil what boils down to the anxiety epidemic is one very simple thing we have a culture that expects us to feel good all the time Mm. and that cultural expectation is so dysfunctional it's it's just not true there aren't human beings who have zero anxiety for their whole lives everybody today, even though we have lots of, you know, by and large, lots of resources, um, you know, in addition to economics, but also uh, technological resources, healthcare, and, you know, notwithstanding important disparities that do exist, that of course, that's, that's definitely a major factor. But, you know, notwithstanding that people today expect that things are going to go their way and that their emotions are going to be even keeled all the time. We have spread Mm -hmm. that message that you're Mm -hmm. supposed to feel good. You're supposed to feel happy a hundred percent of every day. And it's just a myth. It's a, it's a, and the more we pursue that myth, the harder it is. Cause the minute we feel anxious, now I'm a failure. I'm right. comparing myself to this completely unrealistic expectation. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's culture setting that expectation. So then you feel like you never can hit it because you feel like you're always doing something wrong or not living up to it. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. That's so true. Um, I was going to ask this later, but I'm going to ask it now. Um, you talk about how society is like currently over medicalizing anxiety. Oh yeah. Um, how so? And what do you, what do you, what would you like recommend that doctors maybe like do differently? Yeah. It's a really, really huge challenge today. Um, if people go to a PCP these days and they complain about any level of anxiety in the last two weeks, immediately it flags them for a potential diagnosis and potential medical, pharmacological, like prescription of medication treatment for that anxiety. Now, on the one hand, there's some progress there because we have doctors who are recognizing that people struggle with mental health concerns, and I get that. But let me ask you, of all the people who you have seen and met this week, this month, in the last year, how many of them can truly say in the last two weeks that they have had no anxiety and no worry at all. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. I would think no Not one. too many. <laughs> so what we're doing is we've set the bar way too high or too low, depending on how you see it. You know, our, yeah. our definition of a medicalized anxiety is way too low. We're we being mm. too inclusive. And I do think there are some cutoffs, but any anxiety at all in the last two weeks, any worry at all, significant worry in the last two weeks, 
no, that is not a realistic human right. achievement, so to speak, mental health goal even. And when we set it that low, then we end up saying, oh, something's really wrong here when in fact it's called normal, <laughs> yeah. yeah, which is a problem. What are people being prescribed? Like what, what, what are they, what are they Man. given? What, what do you, the what do you common? give for them? Yeah. Yeah. The most common is going to be something called a benzodiazepine. Benzodiazepines okay. is a class of drugs. Um, the most common of those is called Xanax. I'm sure you've heard of Xanax. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Xanax, Klonopin, Valium, Ativan. These are the, these are the familiar faces of, yeah. uh, of pharmacology. And, um, they are fast acting, so they act right away, and then they, um, you know, um, they get, at, get in and out of the bloodstream within either six hours, twelve hours, twenty-four hours, depending on which one people take. Um, and one of the disadvantages is that people never learn that, like, oh, a little bit of anxiety, it's uncomfortable. Don't get me wrong; it's not fun. But yeah. You can actually tolerate it, and it can make people stronger um, mm. and more resilient if we allow ourselves to experience that discomfort. Obviously, at certain points of like my career, I've definitely experienced some high levels of anxiety and stress that have made me, you know, we've like talked about going down the medication route, but I'm like, I don't even like taking Advil. So I'm like, right. I'm just like, I've, I'm, I have this irrational fear. I'm going to have an allergic reaction to like a medication and die. Um, so I don't like taking anything, even though I've taken, I don't know. It like I, a bit of anxiety, actually. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I think that maybe that just comes from nursing out. You're not afraid that you're going to get hooked on it? You're afraid no. that you're going to have an allergic reaction? Yep. What? I wouldn't even take, we were, we were just at Disneyland, and I wouldn't take, like, the non-drowsy Dramamine, because I, I had never taken it before, and I was scared I was going to, like, have a reaction to it, and that's the only reason I didn't take it. Hmm. But. That's a whole Got other it. topic. Uh, no, it's cool. It does sound like a little design. You know, I, I also want to make something clear. Like, I'm not against people taking pharmacology or taking medications in order to For deal sure. with psychiatric conditions. But yeah. if the goal of those medications is to get rid of your anxiety completely, you are heading in the wrong direction. If your goal yeah. is to get it into a manageable level where you have to tolerate some of it and then tolerating more of it over time, that I can deal with. And more than half of my patients are on medications in order to do that. But yeah. Our, we have set this expectation and this, you know, we, we try to use medications in order to control our mood states and get them down to a place where we are always having equanimity, solace, happiness. And it is making our society crazy. It's making things so much harder yeah. because the expectation is an unrealistic one. And that that's the main point that I wanted to sort of say before. Yeah. No, I mean, that's what I think the point I was trying to make before we got off topic is like because I'm afraid to do that, I've had to try out other ways to handle my anxiety and learn how to, you know, take certain steps and able to like handle it. And, um, I obviously has gotten to a point where I haven't like had to do that. And I've learned some tools that I think would be important, which I think we're going to dive into next about your nine tools. But I think it's taught me to learn. It, it has taken me time, but I was actually, I was having an, an anxiety attack in the car on the way to Disneyland. And I knew I was in the whole time. I'm like, this is going to pass. Like, I know, I don't even really know why I'm anxious, but I know this is going to pass because I've, I've had a lot of anxiety attacks over the past few years. And I've learned, you know, certain tools to help me get over it. And I think what you're saying is so true is like, we, we all are going to deal with anxiety and that's, you know, that is a normal thing. And I think me having like, I've kind of learned those tools that have helped me and I'm able to conquer it in a way that definitely still happens, but I've learned how to like handle it and approach it. Yeah. When, but I love what you said before about sort of just knowing you're having anxiety attack, not judging yourself, letting it happen. And being like, okay, it's going to be over soon. It's not a pleasant ride to Disney to Disneyland. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, it'll be over soon. Did it ruin the rest of your day? Can I ask? No, I was I was no. over it in like maybe like forty five minutes in the car. Yeah. yeah. No, she is good at that. I will definitely give that to her. Like the whole ride, she she was just like silent. She before we got in the car, she was like, I'm starving. I need breakfast. So we stopped at a place and got food before we started our drive. The second we started our actual drive, 
she's like, I'm nauseous. I'm not hungry at all. Like she wouldn't talk. I'm like, are you excited for the day? She's like, hmm. And I'm like, what's wrong? And this is, this is always my thing because I, I can't like, I do struggle with anxiety, but I don't think to the degree that Tay, um, you know, deals with it sometimes. And my thing is always, well, what's wrong? And she never can like, you know, answer that question. She's like, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm, I feel an anxiety attack coming and it's gonna, it's gonna pass. Um, you know, I just need some time. And I'm like, okay, but like, what are you worried about? <laughs> and I'm always like wanting to like solve the problem. Yeah. And, um, I think I probably shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's okay, good that you ask. Get into couples sometimes. therapy. This is awesome. <laughs> No, yeah. it's good. Hey, it's good saying? that Sorry. you asked, but but yeah. So I don't think I'm able to. Sometimes I come out of nowhere. Sometimes I have maybe a, a reason. Sometimes I'm like, oh, maybe it's my. I have like severe gut issues. I'm like, oh, maybe it's my IBS that's causing the anxiety, sure. or maybe it's you know, I don't know. But yeah, I was I was actually having an anxiety attack in the car. But Let me yeah, ask, I when know. You get you panicky. Know. What do you need? What do you actually need from your partner? I think just knowing that he's there, which he was just like there and was like, he asked me, I think it's been cool. And we've talked about this on the podcast before is like when during COVID, when I started working and as a COVID nurse and, you know, I was dealing yeah. with mental health stuff for the first time, like to a severe degree, Taylor at first was like, well, what's wrong? And was thinking that, you know, it was him doing something or something that he could fix. And we both had to learn that, you know, it's not something that Taylor could fix. He just needs to support me through it. And that, you know, he has learned that and does a very good job. And I think for me, just knowing that he's there and making him like aware. I mean, he knows without me having to say, if I'm like sitting there, I freaking crank the AC all the way down. I'm like sweating. I'm silent. I'm not eating food. Like he knows, yeah. he knows that something's wrong. Um, so I think like the check-in for me and then just knowing that he's like there even though he's not really like speaking to me or he'll be like, Oh, look, look at the mall or look at that animal driving by yeah. or something. Just knowing that he's there. Definitely. It sounds to me like a presence and not having it being solved or resolved is actually like at the core of what you're looking for, which is yeah. exactly what people with anxiety say all the time. And that's what can create greater closeness and emotional intimacy and connection between couples when one person has anxiety. And I have seen this. Yeah. Yeah. Ten, dozens of times in practice where um, often there are gender differences here, like where the guy's like, let's try to solve this. And, you know, she, let's say she's the anxious one. Um, it can, yeah. you know, that can definitely create um, some uh, complexity there. And then eventually though, it hopefully gets articulated that like, Hey, all I need is for you to hold my hand and yeah. it will pass whether it's in 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 40 minutes or whatever, just to yeah. be here with me while I'm feeling anxious there's a greater emotional connection that can be fostered when somebody's simply present with you in an emotional, in an emotionally charged situation. It actually yeah. is a, right now, I know like the, the tendency is like, I want to fix this and I want to stop feeling anxious, but actually the more you connect with someone while you're feeling revved up, the more close you will feel with them once things naturally settle down. Mm. Yeah. Try it next time. Yeah. No, that. Yeah. That's, makes complete sense. That's great advice. And yeah, that's definitely something we've learned. We've gotten a lot better at <laughs> it. We've gotten a lot better at it for it sure. It does take um, practice. It definitely does. Yeah, for sure. I mean, definitely takes practice. And also I think as the, as the, I mean, I guess both spouses, someone who's in my position, um, you know, not feeling guilty for like saying when you're feeling that way, because then the other partner not taking it personally or not, you know, being upset, we can't find a solution. So I think there's definitely a balance there that both partners um, need to work on. And that's something that we've been, we've definitely have to. That's a great point. You know, often on. one partner will blame themselves for their other person's anxiety and it has nothing to do with them. You know, it's yeah. because they're either, you know, having, like you mentioned, an IBS flare up or because they're having a super, super stressful day at work or because, some, they just slept badly the previous night or it's reminding them of something that happened five years before the relationship even started. Like it's, you yeah. know, and I think there's this tent once we take, if one person takes on the responsibility for the other person's anxiety, it can be very taxing. 
as opposed to like, oh, my role here isn't to get rid of the anxiety. My, oh, my role here is to be here with my partner while they're feeling anxious. That's a much yeah. easier thing to do than to actually get them unanxious, which frankly, yeah. I can't even do. I've been doing this work for 20 years. <laughs> and yeah. like people will freak out in sessions with me and that is not the time to get rid of their anxiety. That's the time to be with them yeah. Um, and just be like, okay, we're going to breathe through this and it's going to happen. It's going to go away when it's going to go away. And let's, yeah. Yeah. you know, that, that, that's what livens the, the space as opposed to like, okay, we got to stop feeling anxious. Obviously that's going to mm-hmm. make the person feel more tense um, and make yeah. their job harder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's so good. Okay. Let's get into your book, Thriving with Anxiety. You share nine tools to help us thrive with anxiety. Um, can you share with us what those are? Uh, all nine. Well, we kind of been talking about a couple. We I know we kind of have. <laughs> we talked about stress and recalibrating and rebalancing. So that's tool one, actually. We also talked about like a lot, the couple stuff and in, in relationship. I'll tell you the way the book's like divided up. So the, the first part is about how anxiety can enhance our relationship with ourselves. So greater mm-hmm. self-awareness, greater understanding of what your needs are, greater rebalancing, recalibrating, and greater resilience, which maybe we'll come back to. Um, but yeah. that's certainly uh, one of the skills is to be able to use anxiety to build your resilience, just like you use physical pain in a gym in order to build your muscles. Yeah. So that's the first set of skills. The yeah. second one relates to our relationships with others. And we talked to actually quite a bit about this already, um, how it can help you to be more empathic and understand other people. It can help you to connect with people. And it can also enhance intimacy, into emotional intimacy and connection when we use those anxious moments and tense moments in order to be there for people um, as opposed to trying to fix it or change it. Just simply mm-hmm. like proverbially holding someone's hand or having them cry on your shoulder can deeply enhance emotional and even eventually physical connection, which is pretty cool. Um, mm-hmm. And then the last part of the book is actually about uh, spirituality, which is something the, the uh, publishers wanted me to dive right into and I didn't shy away mm-hmm. from it. And how people mm-hmm. can self-actualize their greatest, I believe, their greatest potential in this world If you're doing something that you really want to do, you're going to feel anxious. It's going to be tough. You're going to be butting up against barriers and overcoming them and moving forward. And all of that tension means we have to accept it and realize that anxiety is a part of it and then moving over it in order what I call transcending anxiety. Those are the three main parts of the book, and each of those have three skills, hence nine. Yeah. What is... What's... Did we talk about this already? What is the connection spiral? Yeah, connection spiral. That's what's other people. So um, I'll talk about the disconnection spiral first, which is that it starts with other people are doing things that we don't like, right? Like, does okay. that only happen to me? Right. <laughs> happens right. To everyone, right. And then if we're thinking about it really, we're actually feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Like, oh no, what's what's going on here? Why, why are they doing that? It's, it usually brings up a... a, a feel of anxiety for us if we're actually aware of it. But instead of actually expressing that, we tend to blame the person, disconnect from the person, try to get them to change, you know, all of these uh, processes which are usually make the situation worse and they're not really taking the anxiety head on as opposed to connection where we actually just talk about what we're really feeling. Like, hey, what you're doing is really stressing me out and making it hard for me and I'm not blaming you. I'm just letting you know, this is my emotional landscape right now. And usually that diffuses things, takes Mm -hmm. things down a good notch and enables the person to be like, okay, like I get that. Like that's a raw spot for you. That's something I have to tread around carefully. Um, in order to have this connection, we have to, you know, navigate this together. Um, and a connection spiral is when we, instead of getting into that judgment, getting into, attacking mode, withdrawing mode, we're actually really speaking from the heart and saying like, hey, this is what I need right now and this is why I'm feeling really tense. Um, And Mm -hmm. usually that settles things down and brings about a lot more love and connection in the world. Not always, but it's the best card to play in order to get there. Something that I've had to work on um, a decent amount is 
realizing what is out of my control and accepting that and moving on. Um, you do talk about this. Um, what would your advice be to letting go and accepting the things that are out of our control in life? Okay. Firstly, no wonder you don't have that, you know, that much anxiety day to day. I mean, if you can get to a place of being okay, not being in control, there's not much to be anxious about. Yeah. Right. Like if you can sit down on a plane and be okay, down in a seat in an airplane and be okay, not having any control over the cockpit, not even knowing what the flight path is and just like, surrendering the opposite of the opposite of me yeah <laughs> you know god bless if you can do that um yeah but it sounds like you both have something to teach each other by the way you're a good, you're a good team. <laughs> <laughs> that is at the core of anxiety and when we can you know let go that's another spiritual tool um recognizing that humans are just so limited in our capacity to control things i mean yes we have work to do and you know you got to do got to do what you can but at the end of the day like let's be realistic how many factors come from left field that can totally throw us off our horse yeah. um yeah or can make us super successful and they have nothing to do with our real efforts that humility is something that anxiety can help us to embrace i believe um yeah to go there just accept it and uh it's it's not easy, but that's that's you know there's yeah. great opportunity there. Yeah, for sure. It definitely seems like a lot of anxiety comes from the feeling of loss of control. Like when you can't control a situation, whether it's mm-hmm. um you know, yeah, like he said, like, you know, people that have anxiety flying yeah. or whatever it is, like it's it it's a lot like feeling like you're out of control. Yeah. And yeah, that if we could all master that and just brush it off our shoulder. Yeah. Well, I I saw this during COVID that some people did this and they were like, okay, like this is actually out of my control. I'm going to do the best I can, you know, through whatever it is, social distancing or, you know, whatever people had to do at the time. But at the end of the day, like there's only so much. And those were for, for such people, I actually saw amounts of growth during those months yeah. that I don't think they even previously had. That was, they were parlaying their anxiety into an opportunity to move forward. Um, now granted for those of us in healthcare, that was a very hard thing to do because you're faced with these incredible stress. So the stress I think makes it harder to deal with the anxiety. If you have both, like if you're so stressed out, you know, dealing with so many things and having so many patients to deal with and colleagues and hospitals and it was crazy. So that I think made it harder, but, but in theory, if the stress were lower, to be able to go and get to that place of acceptance could actually be a really great thing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So good. Should we get into some holiday stuff? Yeah. Wh- one of one of the reasons we were super excited to talk to you is because the timing is perfect. Because I feel like there is um, a lot of people that deal with heightened anxiety around the holiday season. Um, you know, we're nearing the end of the year where there's a lot of social gatherings and um you know friends family, family strangers family. yeah family dynamics all, all of that yeah. just this this season i feel like is a is a tough one for many um what what would your biggest tips be for navigating the influx of social interactions during you know the next upcoming weeks great first i'm going to tell you what not to do okay okay here's what here here are ways to not th- things that you should not be doing at this time okay um don't not think about the family dynamics don't think like okay i'm just gonna distract myself and pretend that everything's gonna be okay mm. um don't okay. sit down at the thanksgiving's gone now but you know a christmas table yeah. or whatever it is and yeah. just drink away your sorrows uh don't talk not talk to other people about what's going on in your mind don't load yourself up with tons of work. So that way you don't have to think about it because you're just drowning, you know, drowning it away with what you have to do. Don't overspend because you're going to have to pay for that in January. And and all of these are the primary reasons why anxiety gets so intense this time of year and also going into January. Like instead, there's one core approach 
which is recognizing you're going to feel tense. If you have complicated family dynamics, they are going to come up. Think about it in advance. How are we going to navigate that? Who's the friend who you're going to call when you're feeling like you want to cry because of something that, you know, mom, dad, or sister or brother said at the yeah. table? Like who, who is that person? What will you say to them? Will you text them? Will you actually call them? Um, all the other things that I was saying before, efforts to not think about our anxiety, to not experience it, and then we push it away and push it away and push it away, and then all of a sudden it just breaks through and pushes us down, as opposed mm -hmm. to like, no, I know this is going to be uncomfortable and I'm going to deal with this. Yeah. So if you had an anxious holiday season last year, that's a signal that you need to be on top of it. Okay. Um, through through planning and, and and knowing what you're going to do, having a game plan. Yeah. Right. How do you like approach the topic of boundaries? Um, maybe like for someone that hasn't set, you know, a boundary with their family before. Yeah. Great questions. Hmm. Um, often people don't set those boundaries cause they're awkward. Yeah. They're awkward to set, to say like, yeah. I'm not going to talk to, you know, mom about that topic ever again. Like we are just not going to talk about that subject. I'm not going to talk about that relationship or this aspect of my job or, or money or whatever it is. Um, and just to, to know, like, this is an explosive con conversation and I need to set that boundary. Um, or if people say or do certain things and you know that they're going to do that, you know, think to yourself, can I ignore it? Okay. If you can, fine. If not, how are you going to deal with that? Are you going to walk away? Are you going to engage the person? What's going to be the most productive? You know, usually mm -hmm. this requires, um, conversations with yourself, with a loved one, maybe with a therapist in advance and planning it out because these dyna dynamics are, are important um, and hard. They're hard to manage, challenging. Yeah. But yeah. This, is, this is what anxiety is telling us to do. It's, it's calling upon us like we have to deal with this. Yeah, yeah boundaries is a tough one, but it's, it's so important. But it's definitely a, a tricky one, um, yeah. you know, for whatever reason. You yeah. know, How afraid so? of the reaper. I mean... <sighs> afraid of the repercussions if you do you know set a boundary and how the person you're setting reacts. that boundary with yeah. is going to perceive it if they're gonna be like okay great if they're gonna be like explode or like i think that's i think that's probably yeah because in my mind if you were to like you know set a healthy boundary and but just like let it be known i feel like it's not often not incredibly often that that person goes okay, yeah, I totally hear you and I respect that and let's move on. Like it usually doesn't go like that. Usually so not. yeah, I want to make something clear just because you set a boundary doesn't mean you have to necessarily explain that to the person. Right. Right. It could be that like you don't talk to, I don't know, you know, um, certain family member about certain topic. And when the topic comes up, you just make yourself busy and scoot around it. And it's a boundary for you, but you don't have to tell the person because that's just going to blow things up and make things awkward. So yeah, you right. can you can do that and hold yourself accountable and even tell a friend like this, you know, this holiday season, I'm not going to talk to person X about topic Y. That's one of my goals. Right. And yeah. that's a that's a great thing to do. Yeah. yeah, I feel like for I mean, for those people listening who are like, I want to make set a boundary, but I'm scared. I feel like for like the first time I set a boundary with my family, it was like, I was, it was hard. Yeah. It was very hard to do, um, hard on both ends, hard for me to like express myself or even just do it. Cause that's terrifying. Like, you know, it's, a lot of us is, have never done it before. Yeah. And I feel like once that first boundary was set and both parties, you know, accepted it and it was in place, I felt like it is so much easier for me to set boundaries, not just with like that specific, you know, person or family or friends, or whatever, but I've been able to actually incorporate that now into my friendships, into, um, my work commitments, into whatever it is. I've been, it's been a lot easier for me yeah. to set boundaries. Um, so I do just want to encourage people that are listening. Like I understand it's so scary yeah. setting that first boundary because it, I, I, you know, I put, the first time I ever set a boundary, I put it off for years. I'm very non-confrontational yeah. people pleasing person, but I do feel like after you like figure out, like, you know, get comfortable saying that. Cause that's a very uncomfortable thing to do to set a boundary, especially if you don't want to like upset another person. Um, but knowing that's like what is best for you, it definitely like has gotten easier 
for me and I've felt that growth in myself, um, which we've talked about like over the past year, I've definitely gotten more confident in, you know, speaking up for myself yeah. or saying things that I want or that I don't want. Um, but yeah. Amen to all that. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I love that. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess lastly, maybe we just end on is like how, how can we, someone, how can we best support someone struggling like during the holidays? Yeah. Great yeah. question. Mm-hmm. You were going to say Taylor? No. Uh, well, for me, I just, <laughs> when she asked the question, I was just like thinking about it selfishly for me. And I was just like, for me, it goes back to kind of what we started with, which is just like being there, Yeah, you know, just like not trying to perfectly solve the situation and insert, you know, opinions, and, you know, I've learned for you. And I'm sure this is the case for many is just understand that it's going to come. It's normal. And to just let that person know that you are there for them. And that's, that was my, that was my personal answer, but I'm curious to hear yours because you right. I'm, glad, more, um, I'm glad our little couple session wisdom took, than uh, I. took some root over there. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's important um, to know that firstly, if somebody doesn't want to be helped, you can't help them. Mm. And that's, that's a hard thing for me as a clinician. Um, Mm -hmm. because, um, sometimes you meet people and they just, they don't, they're just not ready to make a step, to make a decision, to set a boundary, to do whatever it is. And, um, you know, sometimes there's not much you can do and people are going to, sometimes it's just going to be a bit of a train wreck and, and you have to be more, you know, like Taylor said, just being there for them. Um, I would also, um, you know, encourage people who have loved ones who are struggling with anxiety, um, simply to uh, like, you know, Taylor, I think you nailed it. You know, don't, don't get them, don't get them to change. Just be there with them, support them, use the opportunity to enhance your connection with them. And, um, uh, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, bring that into the new year. You know, even if they have a really rough uh, holiday season, at least your relationship with them can be stronger. Yeah. Who doesn't need that? Exactly. Yep. For sure. Well, I'm like thinking back on like, everything we just talked about i'm really excited to listen to this back yeah it's a very fascinating conversation yeah. that many people need to hear everything we talked about today is something that we both you know struggle with and go through and i know that we are definitely not the only people yeah so i think a lot of people are gonna you know relate to this and are definitely gonna take away a lot of stuff so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your expertise with us um yeah that was this is this was lovely thank you both for all you're doing and for having me on your show really appreciate it of course we're gonna leave a link i'm assuming to your wonderful book thriving with anxiety yes um definitely check that out audible also if people uh want to do the audio oh perfect and uh, i think there's some free giveaways on my website also um so i can send you guys that link if you want to um give that to your audience Um, incredible always looking to engage with people around the subject it's something that you said very ubiquitous everyone has so yeah I love that. Well, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much, David, for joining us. Uh, I hope that you guys are David, you guys on a first name basis now? We introduced him as doctor, so now. Okay. Yeah. Now he's David to us? Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Thanks, Davey. He's awesome. Oh, my gosh. Maybe not there yet. (laughs) Maybe after we have him on again. Uh, We'll leave a link to his book, Thriving with Anxiety. I'm so excited to get this book because I want to read about all of these tools he has so much knowledge like i said we talked to him for a bit afterwards like this conversation was just a tiny little snippet yeah of what he has to offer and we're super excited to have him back on again and dive into more specific topics yeah but yeah hope hope you took something small that can help you over the next few weeks and yeah, definitely go check out his book. Yeah, we have um, a very exciting episode next week, our last episode of the year. Oof. So crazy. So uh, crazy. We have been through a lot with you guys, and we're going to do a fun little recap just on the year and some of your favorite moments uh, that you guys submitted. So we are just, we are over the moon excited. Um, as always, you can email us at lautner.thesqueezepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, guest ideas, subject ideas, Anything you want answered, uh, send it on over. All right. Peace out, Girl Scouts. We'll see you next Wednesday. See you next Wednesday, last Wednesday of the year. Oh, my. (laughs) 
This podcast has been brought to you by Podcast Nation.